We all know the scene. Crusty generals stand hunched over a map table, contemplating their next move while their team buzzes about, shoving the latest telegram in their hand and constantly updating the little flags marching across the battlefield. Much like the concept of the Tactical Operations Center, Hollywood has put these images in our minds to demonstrate a very important task of a higher headquarters element, battle tracking. So what is battle tracking, and is this something that might be helpful for the average citizen living in today's strange and confusing world? Let's find out. At its simplest, battle tracking is simply putting information on a map, mostly pertaining to tracking military units as they move across the battlefield. Going back as far as antiquity, to the origins of warfare itself, battle tracking was quite literally done in person, from a hilltop adjacent to the battlefield that generals could use to visually see the battle space below. Of course, as time went on and we moved through the generations of warfare, commanders who might have been at a disadvantage in numbers began to use terrain to even the odds. The cunning use of terrain is one of the major reasons why Alexander the Great was able to conquer most of the ancient world. Terrain was also the main reason that Wellington outfoxed the Emperor himself in defeating Napoleon Bonaparte at the infamous Battle of Waterloo. So terrain is very important, but from a command and control perspective, using terrain can lead to a lot of problems. In short, if your general cannot sit on a hill and directly see your unit's pennants, your general does not know where you are or how things are going. So what else is there for a general to do but use forward observers to find out where his own troops are, where the enemy is, and plot all of this information on a map? Over time, as more and more battles began being fought in terrain that restricts direct view of troops, maps were used to show where everything was on the battlefield. As the technology of warfare developed and World War I brought strange new horrors to modern war, maps increasingly took a much larger role over the direct observation of troops. And thus the concept of the general's camp on a hilltop shifted more to an underground or fortified dugout from which generals could use maps and telephones to conduct the war away from artillery. From this, we can see the beginnings of the Tactical Operations Center. And really, starting with World War I, we can see the battle staff emerge, with various staff members being tasked with updating the general's map constantly as the front lines shifted during battle. Though this is certainly more of a military subject, as we have seen over the past few years of riots and actual open warfare in the streets, the concept of battle tracking is desperately important for local citizens to understand. This is something that every prepared citizen needs to be capable of, because by the time the average person needs to battle track life-changing events in their area, it will already be too late to learn these skills. As such, one might think that the first step to modern day battle tracking is to get a map, which is actually the second step. The first step is to memorize a lot of boring stuff, mostly the symbols you're going to put on the map. Right up front, before the crisis, know your symbology. This is the hardest part, because you basically have to memorize a lot of different shapes, markers, and icons. But as boring as it is, you need to know at least the general outline of how things work. Your battle tracking skills are of no use if no one can understand the information on your map. Generally speaking, here are the basics of the American Mill Standard 2525. This is the most common set of standard shapes and markers that are used throughout the world. This standard has been in place for many, many years. Generally speaking, blue rectangles are friendly units, red diamonds are enemy units, green squares are neutral units, and yellow clover shapes are unknown or sometimes civilian units. As we can see, there's a few things going on here. We've got the shape and the color, and they both matter. This is important to remember as we move along because even though this is a rigid standard, in practice there is a lot of variation to these symbols. Within the shape, inside the shape, we have indicators of what kind of unit this is. The most common are infantry units, which are designated with a large X in the middle of the shape. And of course this can change. This is what a medical unit looks like, and here is an armored cavalry unit, and so on. 
It's up to you to memorize these on your own, which is why I would highly recommend purchasing a physical copy of the Battle Staff Smart Book. This book has all of the major symbols within it, and it's very easy to study. But anyway, we can see that the interior shapes, whatever they are, do not change based on allegiance. For instance, here is a friendly mechanized infantry unit, and here is an enemy mechanized infantry unit. Same symbol on the inside, but the exterior shape and the color has changed. Now here's something that complicates things a bit more. That shape, that, that rectangle that we've been talking about, that is meant to designate ground forces. But what about aircraft, or naval ships, or spacecraft? Well, the shape changes for that too. So here are a few examples. As we can see, the top of the shape reminds us of whether the unit is hostile or not, and the bottom of the symbol helps us remember whether or not it's a ground force, aviation, naval, or whatever. And of course, remember, the interior symbols remain the same no matter how the exterior shape or the color changes. This takes a while to get kind of used to, but it's pretty simple once you understand the basics of it. But let me throw another uh, wrench into the engine here and we'll confuse you a little bit more. Speaking of that exterior shape, sometimes military battle trackers break the rules and confuse things. So let me explain in case you happen to see something different. We already know that a blue rectangle with an X in the middle is a friendly ground infantry unit. Pretty easy, right? Now, what about this unit? What's going on here? Well, in practice, it's sometimes easier, or it's usually easier, to draw a rectangle instead of a diamond. So throughout many military publications, and in, throughout a lot of historical maps as we can see, you will find all ground units being designated by rectangles with their color designating allegiance. Therefore, the rule of thumb is, no matter the shape, the color always takes precedent. If it's red, it's bad guys. If it's blue, it's friendly. I personally always try to go by color and shape the way you're supposed to based on the standard. But a lot of U.S. Army publications don't do this. So just be advised that if everything on your map is a rectangle, you have to go by color. So let's practice a little bit. You can pause the video now and we'll begin talking about each of these symbols. So first up, we've got kind of a familiar shape, right? We've got the, the blue rectangle with an X in the middle, so we already know that this is going to be some kind of infantry unit that's friendly. But down here in the center, uh, center of the shape, uh, at the bottom, we have what's called a modifier. So we know that this is a friendly infantry unit, but what kind of infantry? In this case, we have the little uh, seagull shape, the little bird shape, right? Uh, so we know that this is going to be a friendly airborne infantry unit. And if we're looking for size, we can look at the very top and see the echelon modifier, which tells how big this unit is. In this case, uh, the two vertical lines there dictate a battalion. So this is a friendly airborne infantry battalion. Up next is a little bit of an easier one. Uh, this one, we have a square, which is green, so we know that this is going to be a neutral unit. And the symbol in the middle is just the letters MP. So this one we can kind of easily remember as military police. So this is a neutral military police unit of an unknown size, because we don't have an echelon modifier. Moving on down the line, the next one is a little bit more difficult. Uh, we know that this is hostile, right, because we have the diamond shape and the color red. So we know that this is a hostile unit of some kind. But what is this symbol? What is this, this large uh, M shape or uh, zigzag line, however you want to describe it? This one you really just kind of have to memorize. This is a pack animal like a mule or a horse or something that's going to be transporting cargo. So this is a hostile pack animal. And finally, we have another kind of confusing one that ordinarily you would never be able to really see. Uh, but if you followed our uh, briefings on uh, a recent incident of geopolitical interest, this one might be a little bit more familiar to you. So we know, for instance, right up front that this is a hostile unit because it's red, so it's going to be hostile no matter what, right? But it's not a diamond shape, or rather the diamond shape is on the top, so we know it's not a ground unit from the uh, vertical lines uh, going down to the bottom of the shape and the lack of a line on the bottom, just kind of like an open bottom, we know that this is going to be an aerial unit. So this is an enemy aerial unit. And you might have guessed from the symbol on the inside, this is a lighter than aircraft, a, a balloon. So this is a hostile aerial balloon. 
Pretty neat little symbols that uh, have, have gotten a lot of use lately. Once you practice this a bit, it will become second nature. Of course, keeping a guidebook on hand is important just in case you stumble upon a really weird or rare symbol that you haven't memorized yet. As a side note, if you happen to use really rare or obscure symbology, I would recommend writing a note in plain English next to the symbol, helping people know what it is. Combat is not the time to be playing Stump the Chump, and nobody is going to be impressed with you for knowing an obscure symbol. The goal is to have a transparent view of the battle space, with no confusion, and you don't want your commander to have to break out a, a book and look, flip through pictures to figure out what the symbol means. So, if you have to bend the standardized rules a bit by placing a few labels, so be it. But now we can move on to the map, which is how we're going to start tracking. Now we can see why having good maps is important. We need maps of a scale appropriate to the area that we're trying to battle track in. If there's a riot in a city, we need to have a map of the whole city. If there's an invasion of some kind, or some kind of lockdown scenario throughout a region, we need a map of, you guessed it, the whole region. Even if we're in a small observation post, we can use a spare range card to battle track if need be. But at this small level, we probably should be focused on observation and security, but again, it depends on the mission at hand. This is why I like to have maps of varying scales available. Like clockwork, Murphy's Law strikes when least desirable, so whenever you need a map, you either won't have one, or my personal favorite, it will be at the wrong scale. So we've got our map, but before we get into the meat and potatoes of battle tracking, a quick note on IPB or intelligence preparation of the battle space. A lot of times, I would say probably most of the time, an event is going to go down somewhere in the world that's going to require you to battle track it, and you're not going to have any IPB products pre-made for that area. You can get your map set up, but you are probably not going to have studied this area before, so quite literally all you have is a blank map, if you have that. That's okay, we can build this out as we get familiar with the area. We don't necessarily want to use the COP for our IPB work, but we can make helpful additions as we find out information to the situation at hand. But for now, since we're probably in a hurry, let's move right to Blue Force Tracking. This is exactly as simple as it sounds. Tracking Blue Forces. Tracking Friendly Forces. It's just putting all of your friendly units on the map and constantly updating their positions as they move across the battle space. Back in the day, this was done automatically on a completely dedicated system called a Blue Force Tracker. Basically, a computer system installed in vehicles and command posts that allowed units to track each other. This system is still very much in use today, but back before the days of modern systems, the BFT was an impressive development in the field of warfare even if soldiers remember it being a constant headache to work with. These days, the high-speed, low-drag tactical solution is ATAC. ATAC has replaced traditional BFT systems in a lot of units, but a lot of units are still using old-school BFT trackers for the most part. But the future is definitely ATAC, which automates Blue Force tracking so that nobody has to physically move an icon across the map. So Blue Force tracking sounds pretty simple. Just put your guys on the map, right? Well, in the real world, it gets a bit more difficult than that, which we'll get into in a moment. The other side of the coin is Red Force tracking. This is the stuff Intel guys should be doing. This is why having an intelligence function is important and by default, why it's important to have reliable information sources. Think about how many people on the internet have been battle tracking the Ukrainian war, and how many of them have been incorrect, myself included. That's because open source intelligence can only get you so far, and that is the only type of intelligence that is going to be available to the general public. So, battle tracking an event where you don't have reliable information is kind of a farce. I get it, it's not easy, especially in a world where most open source intel is heavily skewed, if not outright false. No matter the case, sometimes our best simply isn't good enough, so we have to account for that when battle tracking. When battle tracking more local events, things that you have, you know, more of a stake in, things don't necessarily become easier, but the ability to collect information yourself, it's on the table now. Collecting your own information via radio scanners, software-defined radios or SDRs, or even small quadcopters or other drones, or even just a straight-up observation post, this organized intelligence collection is usually a lot more accurate than anything you'll find on the internet. 
Again, in every single operations center I've worked in, both Blue Force tracking and Red Force tracking fell on the S2 shop because ops didn't want to do it. Since Intel is regrettably sometimes the redheaded stepchild of the battle staff, the S2 guys get saddled with work that isn't technically their job. But anyway, uh, though my team constantly grumbled about it, I never really minded this personally because if the S2 shop didn't track everyone all at once, the S3 would task a random soldier with it who probably wouldn't do it right. So tracking everyone all at once was pretty much what I've had to do in the past. This is important to mention because tracking red forces is not easy. The bad guys don't radio in their position to your talk. You have to go find them or at least guess where they're at or what they're doing. That's why that big purple K tends to get slapped everywhere on maps. The icon for key terrain. Though key terrain gets way overused and used improperly, it's a very quick way to say, hey, this would be a great spot for activities either for the bad guys or for us. This terrain is key. Now let's break this down a bit further. When it comes to physically putting things on the map, there are a couple of ways you can do this. What we do not want to do, however, is draw directly on the map for many reasons. I guess technically you could use a pencil and just erase uh, your markings if you need to move something around. This is historically what has been done uh, many, many years ago before we had uh, the invention of things like plastics, right? Historically, using a pencil to write on a paper map has been done. However, we've got better ways of doing things today. Usually what we want to do is use an overlay of a thin sheet of plastic. Like I mentioned earlier, this is mostly what the military does. Overlays the map with a clear sheet of plastic so that your notes and scribbles can be erased. And it allows you to use colored markers as opposed to using just a pencil, which is going to be, you know, just one color. If you're going to draw on an overlay, there are a couple of things that can help. For one, you can get yourself one or two of these kinds of stencils. You can find these online rather overpriced, but they are quite handy for drawing neat little boxes. This one right here even has the features of a goo horse stick for all of you old school folks out there who remember those. One thing to remember when buying a lot of this stuff is that terrain model gear tends to be Chinese made, and in classic fashion, the communist manufacturing sector is almost entirely based on stealing other people's designs. This becomes hilarious because they don't often know or understand what something is used for when they copy things. So for instance, sometimes the stencil shapes will be backwards or the labels will be on the wrong side. So you've got to constantly flip back and forth if you're trying to make everything uh, be correct. A lot of times the proportions will be wrong or the stencil holes will be too small for any writing implement uh, because remember they are making these off of bootleg photos from products that were originally issued by the government or sold uh, in the PX on base. So just be aware of that when you're looking around. You might have to buy uh, several of these until you find one that actually works. As for me, my bootleg Chinese grade stencils work okay enough for me. Another helpful thing you will obviously need are markers. For battle tracking purposes, I prefer wet erase markers so that the writing is a bit more durable and just won't wipe away. I also like to either write on or use a label maker to label the colors of each marker so that I can pick them out under red light conditions. Speaking of red light conditions, you might want to select a marker for red forces that is a bit off red, uh, or just use black, because under red light, red text is invisible, right? So if you're going to be switching back and forth between normal white light and red light, your map icons disappearing can be pretty frustrating. For flexibility purposes, I usually prefer the other main way of putting icons on the map, un unless of course I've got to remain mobile. If I'm working you know, out of a vehicle and I've only just got my map board to work from, of course I'm gonna be drawing on that map board, uh, drawing on the plexiglass, you know, like, like you're supposed to, right? But for a fixed position where you can lay a map out on a table, I like to use laminated icons that I print out myself. Any good S2 shop should have a shoebox full of these, but you can easily make your own. On the back of each little marker, I like to glue either a penny or a small magnet. The penny helps weigh down the small slip of paper so that it won't blow away easily in the wind, or in case you know somebody walks by the map table and like their shirt catches the edge of the map or something. Uh, you don't want all of your your symbols just you know kind of blowing away. Gluing a magnet on the back will do the same thing, but also make it so that you can stick these symbols to a magnetic whiteboard. This is pretty helpful for wargaming or for practice or whatever. The reason you might want to go with a penny instead, uh, the, the non-magnetic option, is if you have to place a lot of these symbols right next to each other, uh, the magnets might want to stick together and generally just might be kind of frustrating to use. 
Whatever you choose, both the magnet or the penny help elevate the symbol so that it's easier to grab and pick up off the table instead of laying flush on the surface. Seems like it's really not worth mentioning, but man, this is frustrating. So really putting anything on the back of these pieces of paper adds a little bit of thickness so they're easier to, to pick up. I also keep a lot of plain symbols without anything on the back, just in case I need to improvise something on the fly. Uh, it's easier to staple these to a popsicle stick and you know stick them in the ground uh, rather than having to peel off a magnet or something. I like to keep these stored in my map case, which has a three ring binder to accept these sheet protectors that are meant to store like baseball cards. I use a label maker to label each pocket so that if I have to yell across a talk for somebody to hand me a symbol, they can find it easily. It also helps me when I'm not thinking too clearly or are super tired. You know the drill, gross motor movements are key and labels help prevent any confusion. You don't need to make thousands of symbols, just a couple of sheets of the most common symbols will do. You don't need to go absolutely crazy and print out all, you know, 50,000 of these symbols. Anything special can be improvised on the fly by drawing on blank symbology icons. This is what I do most of the time anyway if I'm not making custom symbols myself. I usually just use the blank ones and then fill in the interior as needed. So you might ask, okay, where do I get these symbols? Hasn't somebody already done this? The answer is yes. Uh, active duty folks have access to what we call the MOAG, the mother of all graphics. Uh, this is a rather infamous PowerPoint file that has pretty much every battle tracking graphic pre-made. Uh, this makes it easy to cut and paste into your own PowerPoints. Now if you search around the internet you will probably find various versions of this PowerPoint, but it's not widely available to we lowly peasants. You need to have a login to be able to get uh, to get to this PowerPoint. It's mostly just hosted on Nippernet sites, so unless you're you know in the military you're not going to have access to this. The good news is, is that we have something better. Uh, I prefer to use this website, Spatial illusions. This comes from a sole developer who has created an online tool to generate symbology icons, all for free. If you want, you can support the developer by donating, and if you donate 40 euro, you get a license code to run this entire website offline. Very handy for non-networked computers. So that's basically where you can get your symbols to print out at home. You can find or make your own version of the MOAG, or you can use the free Spatial Illusions tools. It's up to you. I use the Spatial Illusions generator and just paste the icons into a PowerPoint slide so that it's easy to print out and so that I have it for the inevitable PowerPoint briefing anyway. Other stuff you might want to have in your terrain model kit includes the following. Like I mentioned earlier, popsicle sticks are pretty handy, mostly for terrain models so that you can stick them in the ground, but you can also use them to outline roads, show points of interest, and so on. Various kinds of string or yarn can help delineate front lines, key terrain, fields of observation, stuff like that. Usually you're going to need at least red or blue, probably black as well to outline stuff like roads, and purple for key terrain. Uh, sometimes you'll see yellow for fires kind of stuff, you know, for targeting sort of stuff, um, and orange as well for stuff that are like obstacles. But there's really no standard for what different kinds of colors mean other than kind of like the generic red and blue, so just get a multi-pack of of whatever kinds of yarn uh, you want. And just be clear to delineate what these are. You can use little slips of paper to, to label what the yarn means once you have it on your map. Some kind of pointing device uh, so that you don't have to you know lean all the way over a map and point with your finger at something. I used to love laser pointers. Uh, these used to be the industry standard. When I was working professionally as an analyst, everyone had a green laser pointer in their pocket. Uh, nowadays and towards the end of my professional career, I found that uh, laser pointers are just too distracting for the masses these days. Uh, basically, I started having an entire audience of cats with zero attention spans. So since then, I have switched back to the old standby and now use just regular collapsible pointers. A map protractor is pretty helpful uh, just because nobody tends to have an extra one on them when it comes time to make the map or uh, make the terrain model, so having an extra is always handy. Uh, make sure you get the ones with dual scales for 1 to 24,000 and 1 to 25,000 uh, so they work with civilian maps uh, as well as military maps. Remember, in the civilian world, we're probably not going to be using military maps. We're going to be using like USGS maps, which are one, usually 1 to 24,000. Various construction tools like nails, screws, push pins, thumbtacks, duct tape, stuff like that. Uh, all of this is very helpful to improvise various things on the fly or to help attach maps or markers of some kind to a you know, wall if you wanted to hang things vertically. 
I also keep a stapler handy just because you're going to need one, and even this tiny one is a little bit too bulky uh, for my map case, so it kind of lives in the terrain model stuff. Uh, it's also really handy for stapling icons to popsicle sticks if you wanted to do that for like a terrain model. Spare range cards are pretty handy to have uh, because you can ask your dudes to bring along their range cards from their positions, and you can copy down that information to your own range cards, uh, which makes it really helpful to be a lot more accurate when depicting fields of fire on your map. A rather odd addition are random blocks of wood. Uh, these are basically squares of 2x4s cut off to make blocks that represent buildings. Uh, obviously this is for a large scale terrain model and not so much a map table. So I personally do not use these often at all. Uh, but we do have a box of these in the office just in case I need to make a larger scale terrain model on the ground or something like that. This is really more of a special case thing that I keep separate from the rest of my small scale terrain model stuff. And finally a lot of pre-made icons uh, have usually found a home in my kit over the years. You can buy terrain model kits online, and for the military guys, they are sold at every PX. At least the small scale ones are. Uh, these are way, way overpriced, and I do not recommend them. Uh, it's better to just make your own. Uh, but despite this, I have found myself sometimes unprepared over the years and needing to buy a pre-made kit. So I tend to have a lot of leftovers from scavenging other kits. You don't need to nerd out on this stuff too hard. You'd be surprised at how little you need to battle track. A small Ziploc bag of small laminated paper icons will get you a long way, and it takes up almost no space or weight. These are a great addition to pretty much any map case. Now we can see that a plan is coming together. We should have a fairly full map that is constantly being updated by all parties involved. A map showing where the good guys are and where the bad guys are likely to be. But battle tracking is a little bit more than just that. In addition to doing this stuff on a map, you might want to consider having an event log. If you have the time and personnel to dedicate to this, it would be a really good idea to have a chronological log of events. This is usually super simple. It can be an Excel spreadsheet, or it can be a physical paper log like a deck log or a staff duty log. All that goes into this is the time of day and whatever event occurred. You can be as in-depth or as simple as you like, but really this event log is used for two purposes. One, so that commanders and people in leadership positions can, at a glance, see what has happened since they stepped out of the talk. The other main use is to remind people in the talk of what time something happened. It sounds stupid simple, and it really is, but you'd be surprised at how many people will forget when a medevac call dropped or when an engagement happened. In the heat of the moment, nobody is looking at their watch, so it's helpful to dedicate one person to write all this stuff down as it happens. Another use of an event log is more forensic in nature. Sometimes, when things go sideways, and there's going to be an investigation later, we need to have a detailed, down-to-the-minute log of exactly what happened. We need to know what everyone knew at that time, and how information flowed throughout the operation. Usually, the person dedicated to do this will be the assistant to whomever is on radio watch. Usually, you want at least two people manning the radio so that one can do the talking and another can do the writing. So it's not too much extra work to just keep the log in a format that everyone finds useful, not just for radio stuff. However, again, in the real world this often doesn't get done, and a lot of time the operations out of the house can't or won't spare an extra person to keep an event log. So sometimes this job falls to the intel dudes who usually have a lot of extra whiteboards and large format paper to display the data anyway. So we can see that this is a very fluid process. It's constantly changing and and it is going to change a lot based on the skills of the people that, you know, you have around you, right? If people are just not really up to the task of doing certain things, it doesn't matter what the manual says, it's got to get done somehow, and sometimes the people who are not best suited for a job have to do the job anyway. Everyone has their own personal battle tracking habits, but I will share some of mine in case it helps. One of the major things that I do, because very few other people do it, is constantly search for HLZs or helicopter landing zones. Even though this is part of the mission planning process, this is part of METTC, right? I am always on the lookout for helicopter landing zones, as close to the ground force as possible. Of course, you need to have a lot of knowledge on this. 
It's not as simple as finding a large open space that you think a helicopter can land at. You need to consider altitude above sea level and know the general characteristics of your helicopter's engines to know if it's even possible to fly there with a certain amount of weight and fuel. You need slope analysis of the potential HLZ to determine if a bird can land there or if this is going to be a pinnacle landing or even worse, a hoist. If it's a hoist mission, you need to consider obstacles, visual aids for the pilots to, to look at as they're trying to hold hover. And as an intel guy, you need to consider line of sight analysis from the altitude above ground that the helicopter is going to hover at so that you can tell if they're going to hover at this altitude, at this location, at this grid, who's going to be able to see them or shoot at them. If it's a small HLZ, you need to think about the security of the orbiting sister ship that's going to have to orbit. Are they going to get shot at because they're you know doing donuts in the sky up there and they're a fat juicy target? Uh, so are they going to have to hold station a couple miles away? That adds in more fuel consumption, adds in more time, and it's another place wherever they're going to have to orbit. That's a whole other place that you got to do analysis for to figure out where the bad guys are at. On the ground, I'm constantly thinking, okay, once the ground force gets to this tree line here, the only medevac that can be done is hoist, if that. But if they take contact from this building over here, that medevac HLZ that we planned for can't be used, so we need another one, like, right now. As we can see, this is a very big thing to think about. Uh, and it happens quite a lot. Uh, this is a constant thought process, and I personally tend to obsess over finding suitable HLZs. It's just a habit that I've developed that probably isn't that useful for me anymore, but now I also do the same thing with egress routes by land. We've all heard the phrase, never enter a room until you know how you're going to get out of it again. Same thing applies in the woods, or really any place where World War III is currently being fought. So this is always at the front of my mind to update as a ground force makes their way through an area. Always keep looking for a way out, just in case you need it. Directly related to the previous bullet point, always keep medical on the line. Nobody keeps the medical folks updated on the mission as it goes on. So if you are in a talk and you have dedicated medical personnel that need to be informed, get your rear end out of your seat and go brief them. Intelligence and medical needs to be in lockstep with each other, and I honestly don't know why this relationship always tends to get neglected in the military, but it does. Many times I've had to run out to the parking pad to give dust-off pilots a heads up that the ground force is getting ready to go into a pretty hairy area. They always appreciate the heads up because most of the time the intel picture that the medical guys have comes from monitoring the radio, which is not even a fraction of the whole picture. During an operation, when the operations guys go to work, the intel guys, for the most part, are pretty much done, except for battle tracking and stuff like that. Unless something goes sideways really badly, intel should really be just invested in monitoring changes, because the bulk of the S2 shop's work is done. Since this is the case, it makes no sense to neglect medical. These guys need to know what's going on, which routes to take, where the bad guys are at. If helicopters have been a priority for them, do the bad guys... Do we think that they have night vision now, or thermal, or stuff like that? And so on. From my own experiences overseas, many lives have been saved by simply an intel guy walking out of the talk and out to the medevac birds and casually chatting with the pilots and the crew chiefs for a minute or two. It sounds like it wouldn't be that big of a deal, but in the medical world, seconds count, and these guys can use all of the advance warning they can get. On the prepared citizen side of things, this is even more important. I don't know about anybody else, but I don't have a medevac chopper on standby for when I go out into the woods, so everything becomes more casual and simple, but even more important. If you are planning for a riot to break out in your city, or even a major military action like a lockdown or something, a key part of your team will be medical personnel. And by that I mean anybody that isn't fighting, but is otherwise physically capable, is a stretcher bearer. Again, pointing to the importance of those whose role is not in combat. Friends and family who aren't physically able to fight, or they have to care for children, or otherwise are not on the front lines, these people can certainly fill very important roles, like medical. As we can see, this goes beyond the scope of battle tracking, as medical personnel need to be kept in the loop regarding enemy tactics, too. If enemies in a local area are known to use certain kinds of weapons, like chemical weapons, white phosphorus, red phosphorus, or even incendiary munitions, cluster munitions, things like that, the medics need to know this so they can plan and equip themselves accordingly so that they have an idea of what kinds of wounds or injuries to expect. So if you've got an improvised clinic set up in your kitchen, it would be a good idea to keep everyone, including those tasked with medical needs, on the same page. 
Moving back to the more battle tracking side of things, it would be very, very helpful to make notes reminding yourself to check positions of units if you don't have any way of tracking units automatically. A lot of times, friendly units will not explicitly state their position, and they get annoyed when some pogue back in the talk asks them where they're at on the radio. What they don't know is that pogue in the talk is plotting their grid, pre-planning a medevac HLZ for them as they move in case something happens. A lot of times, talk people look out for the ground force way more than the ground force realizes, and all of this is dependent on the ground force's location. I've seen some pretty bad stuff happen to units who did not report their position for a while, and suddenly they're in a troops in contact or a tick situation. Now, back in the talk, we've got to figure out where they are. Find them a medevac route. Let the medevac people know the hasty situation, and generally be more unprepared than we otherwise would have been if the dang ground force told us where they were. Considering most prepared citizen groups will not have blue force trackers, and probably will not be using ATAC in a network, keeping the talk updated with position data is very important. And since that probably won't happen anyway, it's the talk's job to pull that information whenever they can. You don't need to annoy the ground force every 60 seconds asking for a position report, but hey, if, you know, uh, 10 minutes goes by and they haven't said anything, you need to figure out where they're at. Another thing to remember is to not forget other domains. Looking at a map of the Earth's surface, it is easy to forget the air, sea, and even space. Some information relevant to battle tracking cannot be tied to a specific GPS coordinate. So having a supplementary information board off to the side of the main map, this can help with a lot of pertinent but generalized information. So you can have your main map and then off to one side you could have your event log and on the other side of the map you could have just like general stuff that people should probably know. This is especially important for keeping tabs on what we call the Enemy Electronic Order of Battle or EOB. Unlike a traditional order of battle, which is basically just a, a list of all of the equipment and forces a unit has, an EOB is more capabilities focused. Jamming, GPS spoofing, and other electronic warfare capabilities, they need to be accounted for here too, even if we can't physically put them on the map. Another topic which is honestly more of a debate, but it needs to be addressed when we talk about battle tracking. And that is the idea of decentralization. Generally, decentralization can help, but be careful. Right up front, I want to say that decentralizing battle tracking efforts is generally a bad idea and can lead to very, very bad things happening. But it happens anyway, and it might not be all that bad in the end. This is pretty confusing, so what does this mean? Decentralizing a common operational picture into several different maps in different areas sometimes happens. Generally, you want a common picture, right? Literally everybody sharing one large map. If you've got multiple tracking maps, one map for blue forces, one map for red forces, it is easy to get confused and for unit positions to be out of date or be called into question. It's just a horrifically bad mess. But decentralizing the battle tracking happens anyway. For instance, people in different observation posts might be off the hook for what event is going on, but they might start tracking the battle from their position. I know that for me, due to my role, I battle track from wherever I am. Sometimes it's not effective, but I do it anyway, if I don't have a job to do. If I'm stuck in the back of a vehicle, away from the talk's main maps, I'll battle track on my own map boards, sometimes even a handheld GPS. Back in the day, Garmin GPS unit served as my, my team's own personal little battle tracking tool, far more than I'd like to admit. If you're going to decentralize battle tracking efforts to spread around the workload, I would strongly recommend against splitting up red and blue forces. This is something I saw in the Navy an awful lot, and I understand why they do it. It's just something that I personally just kind of revolt at. I always keep red and blue forces on the same map, no matter what. If you split them up, you're going to have a bad time. If you're going to split things up, here's how I would recommend you do it. You can track operations at different levels. For instance, if your city, if your whole city was being invaded or locked down or whatever, the talk 
can track the entire city, keeping, you know, larger unit sizes on the map. So the talk is not going to track anything lower than, like, a battalion, maybe a company, right? But if your cop is the size of an entire city, you're not going to be putting down icons of individual vehicles or individual tanks, right? But the hasty talk that's being run from somebody's living room, they might want to take note of that because at their level, their map is going to encompass probably just their street and maybe the immediate surrounding area. This is where decentralizing can be helpful and why we have talks at multiple levels of command. A higher level, very high level uh, talk is not going to have some of the smaller units and a talk at the very lowest levels of command, they're going to have a smaller area of operations. A smaller talk at a lower level, even if it's just one guy like me in the backseat of a car, that one-man talk or observation post can report back to the larger, higher-level operations center. They can report back with anything pertinent, while at the same time battle tracking their very small view of the world. Nowadays, I've upgraded to various map boards to help my effort in addition to computerized options. This way, I can walk into any sized operation center from a, from a very large uh, headquarters element with hundreds of people in the talk down to a small squad level room in somebody's house, right? So I can flex depending on which size of operation I'm going to be working with, right? Most of the time nowadays, you know, as an ordinary citizen, I really go with much smaller level operations. But I'm always prepared for if somebody out there is more organized than me, I can easily plug into their system, like with disaster response or something. So all in all, we can see that this decentralization may have a lot of use even if we don't want to admit it. Sometimes the people in the seat aren't the best people for the job. And sometimes the talk, the big headquarters talk, just doesn't battle track very well. Water finds its own level, and I've seen people migrate to specific individuals' offices because one guy in the back of the headquarters <laughs> building was tracking the battle better than the entire talk. It sucks, but it sometimes happens. For me, I tend to keep a SIP, a common intelligence picture, separate from the main cop. This is probably, actually this is almost certainly a bad habit on my part, but it's often necessary because I have so much information that is not necessary for the main tracking map. My maps are a mess. They tend to be quite cluttered, I mean organized, but still very cluttered, with information and notes, which isn't the best for a battle tracking map that should be as simple and accurate as possible. But again, you must remember that if you keep a separate tracking or planning map, you cannot forget to update the main cop if you have something operationally meaningful. Too many people have died because some intel weenie forgot to share life-altering intelligence. Don't be that guy that knows about the machine gun on the ridge but doesn't put it on the map. Another big debate in the battle tracking world is the idea of analog versus digital battle tracking. With all of the tools at our disposal in today's world, the question often comes up, can't we do all of this on our computers or phones? In fact, a lot of modern battle tracking has to be done on a computer or a phone because of how constantly data is updated. A great example of this, like I already mentioned, is ATAC, which takes care of Blue Force tracking automatically. This can't be done on a map with a marker. I mean, it can, but it requires a human to do it, you know, every 60 seconds dropping a new pin, right? The DoD at large has spent a lot of your tax dollars investing in technologies like the old school Geeks, uh, DCGS, uh, Palantir Gotham, or Palantir uh, spinoff Gaia. All of these are used to battle track, among other things. The DoD is trying to make paper maps a thing of the past, which in today's world is perhaps not entirely a bad idea, except that in today's world it is a very bad idea. <laughs> As technology becomes more of a component of warfare, it also becomes a vulnerability. Yes, stuff like ATAC is a huge benefit on the modern counterinsurgency battlefield. But in GPS-denied environments or places where a radio signal results in an artillery strike, these tools that have so much power in the counterinsurgency world might end up getting us all killed if the situation is a little different. As always, everything is a balance, and we don't need to completely change our entire doctrine based on a case study or two. I personally prefer to use both methods if the battle space permits, and most importantly, if people are actually using it, ATAC is a great option. I can tie a whole team together and know where everyone is at a glance. That makes it easier to automate blue force tracking so that I can just focus on where the bad guys are. However, I also keep my physical paper maps updated too. 
That way, if I have to ditch my phone for some reason, or if I have to go into a controlled space where cell phones are not allowed, or it would generally be a bad idea to bring one in, paper maps allow me to take my data wherever I need to. Is this duplication of effort? Yes. Is it necessary? Also yes. A lot of the time, I prefer doing things the old school way if possible. Not really for nostalgia reasons, but for the reasons that, look, if there's an old tactic that you still know about and is still, you know, decently popular, the reason that that tactic has remained a commonality for such a long period of time is because it's it works. Of course, we can't let nostalgia let us make bad tactical decisions or lose capabilities simply because we want to, to use an, an older way of doing things that may not be the best. But I've found that on the civilian side of things, on the prepared citizen side of things, where everything is analog anyway, battle tracking with a map and a marker is about the same effectiveness as some of the more high-tech options. And sometimes that's all you've got. Uh, even in 2023, it is like pulling teeth to get any prepared citizen to buy a radio. And if we add in stuff like Mesh-tastic and ATAC, which is a little bit more advanced than just, you know, buying an FRS radio or something like that, that's just a bridge too far for a lot of people. For, for many reasons that are perfectly understandable, like, you know, stuff breaking or not really being easy to set up, but some reasons are really just laziness. Either way, it's a reality, and tracking an incident using digital methods, while obviously offering a lot of capability, they're just sometimes not an option in the civilian world, as much as we might want them to be. As a prepared citizen, we have to work at the level of the lowest common denominator, and sometimes that requires giving up capabilities. It sucks, but until more people become serious about being a prepared citizen in today's world, until more people start stepping up, we have to accept that the tip of the spear is sometimes a lonely place. As for me, I would recommend using technology as much as you can, but don't let it become a liability. And of course, always be prepared to revert back to simple, tried and true methods in case you have to. Alright everyone, let's take a look at what a lot of these uh, processes and stuff might look like in the real world, using a real world example in a more unfiltered and raw kind of way. So many of you understand and kind of know about what's going on in Niger right now uh, and uh, really throughout the whole West African region. But I wanted to take this as, and use this as an example uh, because it's something that people are very unlikely uh, to care about. And it's something that is a little bit easier for me to both learn myself and uh, test some of my own skills. Uh, but also it's an easier way to uh, show what a lot of this looks like in real time, basically. This is also a great example because I myself know very little about Western Africa. I'm not a, an Africa expert by any means. I uh, only barely know about the United States involvement in Niger uh, from a counterinsurgency perspective. You know, a lot of counter ISIS, counter uh, Boko Haram actions going on in the north of the country. And we have a very large uh, drone base there. But other than that, it's a foreign topic to me. So again, I thought it would be a very good exercise to see for me what this more organic battle tracking would look like and, and uh, see if we're going to give up any capabilities. So as we can see, this is really just a good exercise all around. And one of the ways this is a really good exercise is that I don't have the resources I need. In typical fashion, we have to sometimes battle track with the, with the resources that we have. And I don't have even half of the gear that I need. My maps are not correct. I don't have a lot of the instruments that I need uh, to be a little bit more professional looking. So this is exactly what somebody like me might do if they just grab their map case out of their rucksack and they're forced to kind of sit down and battle track an event, especially one uh, that is as large if we're talking like an, an international kind of event like this. So. So let me explain what I mean. Uh, as we can see, starting out fresh, I have uh, basically just my uh, West African roadmap here. Now this is just a simple Michelin roadmap. It's not the right scale. Uh, this, I don't even know what scale this is, but it's in the millions, I'm sure. Either way, it's a very large scale map. I need a much closer scale map, a much smaller scale, uh, so that I'm not looking uh, that this entire map is basically the battle space. Uh, right now, most of my icons and battle tracking efforts are going to be right here, kind of clustered together. It's going to make it harder to battle track because a lot of icons and, and unit markers are going to be kind of overlapping a little bit. But again, this is raw. This is the resources I have on hand right now. So we've just kind of got to make do with what we've got. I have, however, added an overlay. So uh, a lot of you might recognize this as the, let's see here, uh, the P-51 
piece of plexiglass from a standard uh, battle board system. Now, ordinarily, I would be battle tracking off of this, uh, like I mentioned, by just drawing on the overlays, uh, all the overlaid icons onto the plexiglass here. But again, I wanted to spread things out and do things a little bit more, a little bit more professionally. And shows some of the some of the ways that I would do this if I had a tabletop at my disposal. But again, you can just battle track from a battle board. That's what they're made for, right? Uh, battle boards are becoming a lot more popular, especially in the you know for people that have to battle track a lot. They're extremely expensive for what you get, but you can't really do much better if you're mobile. However, if you have the chance to sit down and to work off of a table like I'm doing here, uh, you can use some of the parts from a battle board system. Uh, to make an overlay here. I don't have a sheet of acetate with me. I don't have a clear sheet of uh, flexible plastic that I can lay over this whole map. Uh, so I have to use the resources I have, again, which is my battle board piece. So we'll be using that. One thing you have to remember with overlays, however, is that they're going to move unless you fix them down. Now, ordinarily, like I mentioned, I would have a sheet of acetate, a clear sheet of plastic, some kind of cellophane or something, and I would be able to clamp it uh, using binder clips to the edge of the table so that it won't move. Uh, and that I can write uh, on the plastic instead of writing directly on the map. I don't have that luxury here. Again, I have to use the tools that I have. So what I've done is on this uh, sheet of plexiglass here is I've put key markers for cities uh, that I can line up with the map. So that if somebody moves the map, I can very easily take it and line it right back up where it's supposed to be. Kind of a jury-rigged solution, but it works and uh, that's what I'm going to have to use. Now, like I mentioned, this is just the early steps. This is what somebody like me is going to do. They're going to take this stuff out of their, out of their map case or out of their rucksack and go to work. So what are we going to be doing first? Well, in classic form, like I've dedicated hours to talking about on YouTube and all over the internet, we need to stick to processes, right? We have the combat intel cycle. We have the intelligence preparation of the battle space steps we can work through. We have um, all kinds of different processes that we can work through. Uh, to, to get a better intelligence picture of what's going on on the ground. And this applies to more operations stuff too, not just intel stuff. But in classic form, this is kind of the exception that proves the rule, that we can talk about rigid doctrine, we can talk about uh, really good processes to work from, but in the real world, sometimes you got to do a bunch of stuff at once. And right now, what I'm doing is starting to look around at all the different nations, how they're aligned, terrain features, major rivers, major roads, uh, good portions of the Sahara Desert that are largely uninhabited or only inhabited by bandits, uh, and stuff like that. So just from the map alone, we haven't cracked open a single resource, we can start memorizing key cities, key landmarks, uh, how the terrain looks, if this is a sort of map that delineates terrain, and it kind of does. It shows uh, some of the more rugged terrains in the northern parts of Niger, uh, some of the parts of the Great Sahara, right? So we can see the very first step, for, for us at least, is just to kind of understand where things are at. We can dedicate hours, days, weeks to studying this map and memorizing where every little thing is, but really, I'm just getting kind of an overview. Another thing to help you get an overview is, again, like I mentioned earlier, is a good uh, pocket atlas. So we have right here uh, a, a good resource for learning a little bit of very basic information about the country. For instance, I can look and see that the total area is 489,188 square miles. Again, it's really hard to get a, a feel for uh, scale when you're looking at a map. Even if the scale's listed, it's really hard to say, all right, how big is this area of operations? Well, by looking at the square mileage here, I can tell you that Niger is about twice the size of Texas. So that gives you kind of an idea of how big this area of operations is. It's fairly large. However, from the atlas, we can also tell that there's not a whole lot of people there. Uh, the population density as of the publication of this guide uh, is 44 people per square mile. Now that uh, population density, of course, flexes throughout the country. We can tell just by looking at the map where the roads are, people are. And we can tell that along the southern part of the country is where most of the people uh, in this nation are centered. The northern parts of the country are uh, very open, very sparse, but there are uh, highways and uh, byways and things like that up in the northern parts of the country. We can also tell a little bit about the economy. Again, it's going to be impossible to get culture and history from a map in most cases. Some maps will, will actually uh, be very helpful for that, but an atlas and a history book really is going to be your best resource for that. But I can read right here from the economy section in this book that there are vast uranium reserves throughout Niger. Uh, they are an oil producer from 2011, they have frequent droughts and, and food shortages, and they are prone to banditry. 
Uh, they're also an expansion of the Sahara Desert. So we get kind of an idea of this is your classic Western African nation, probably an extremely high poverty rate, probably a lot of warlord situations going on, which is going to probably play an impact on the political and military situation throughout Niger. So again, we're just starting to get an idea of what this battle space is looking like. Now, unfortunately, we don't really have a great avenue of approach for tracking uh, what's going on in the country. Again, we're trying to battle track. Remember, we're trying to track the events that are going on throughout this crisis. And unfortunately, we don't really have good information sources to do that. If you don't have good information sources, your ability to battle track is not going to be that great. Basically, you have to have information to put on the map. And right now, our main resources are going to be Telegram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, alternative media sites, basically social media, open sources, right? Open source intelligence is really a, a has historically been a very good resource. Remember the old statistic that you know Bin Laden himself said that Al Qaeda can get you know eighty percent of their information from open sources. However, in today's fifth generation battle space, open source intelligence has become very uh, unreliable in some in some aspects. It's still all we have, so we have to use it. But the huge chunk of the OSINT world has become politicized. So people ignoring information. Uh, because they are trying to help their political allies or people pushing false information because uh, they're trying to help their uh, their their uh, allies as well. So, so again, that's something to think of. You have to keep source reliability in the forefront of your mind when you're using OSINT sources. And a lot of the times we're not able to get those, you know, perfect A1 sources, right? We're having to, to deal with really unreliable information most of the time. But since this is our very... Uh, the very start of this process, let's take five, ten minutes or so, run through Telegram, run through Twitter, and let's see what we can make of the situation on the ground, at least halfway reliably, right? All right, ladies and gentlemen, so this is what you're going to be able to get after about five minutes worth of effort, five, ten minutes uh, worth of effort. Remember, we're trying to run through the combat intel cycle very, very quickly. We're not able to issue collection on our own. Uh, so we're really having to do more of a quick and dirty IPB, right? Get as much stuff on the map as we possibly can, uh, and then we can kind of figure out uh, some of the backstory and start building on what's actually going on. But for right now, since we're in the trenches, we're, we're doing a quick and dirty process, we need to know where the bad guys are at and where the good guys are at. Now, right up front, I want to stress that it's not quite as clear in Africa when you're talking a lot of these African conflicts as to who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. I'm not saying that red forces are entirely bad and I'm not saying that blue forces are entirely good. Uh, it's a very complex situation. For now though, since we have to work using something, uh, we're going to go with the rebel forces that, that uh, have taken control of Niger are going to be red forces and uh, the ECOWAS nations that are supported by the United States are going to be blue forces and of course the United States uh, soldiers are going to be blue forces just for simplicity's sake. Now when we start getting into other nations and other actors like insurgent groups within Niger we'll have to depict them differently. Um, but for now this is what we're going with. But again, this is just the very, very initial steps. And here's what we've been able to find out so far in about 10 minutes or so, scanning Twitter, Telegram, stuff like that. Starting with the Red Forces, we know that a huge concentration of forces has uh, set up shop in Niamey, uh, the capital, obviously, because that's where the military leadership has set up uh, their, their control there in the government quarter. We also know that Red Forces, I'm not able to depict them on the map just yet, but we do know that there are Red Forces moving uh, to the north of the uh, Nigerian army, which has set up shop in the northern part of Nigeria in the Sokoto district. Nigeria is sending a lot of their forces up to the north uh, in preparation for an impending invasion. Again, timing is critical. As of right now, the 5th of August, uh, Saturday the 5th of August, we have an ultimatum that has been given by ECOWAS uh, to reinstate the uh, democratically elected president or else we're coming, we're coming to invade. It's going to be expiring uh, tomorrow, Sunday, uh, at midnight, and we'll have to see uh, what happens from that. Again, since you're going to be watching this video in the future, you're going to have the benefit of hindsight. Uh, but for right now, we're preparing for what looks to be like a fairly substantial uh, military action if uh, this all goes to plan. One of the complicating aspects of that plan is the American forces, and this is why uh, people might be more concerned with uh, what's going on in Niger because we have a substantial military force 
uh, in uh, a collection of bases, really just uh, it's base 201 up there uh, just to the south of Agadiz, but there's also a CIA presence there as well. Uh, we'll get more into that as we get better uh, and a better understanding of what we're talking about numbers-wise, but for right now, I've grossly overestimated the number of U.S. troops on the ground. I've got templated, which is, again, this is an overestimation. I'd rather be safe than sorry, uh, but we've got uh, the equivalent of a uh, battalion of CIA uh, spooks operating uh, in that area. It's almost certainly vastly smaller than a company, but who knows? Uh, we also have a fixed wing element there, uh, Army Aviation, or really it should be Air Force Aviation, uh, who run drone ops out of there, fixed wing operations uh, out of that area. This, that's really all I know, and I'm templating uh, just, again, another battalion. But again, it's really hard to guess as to how many Americans are there. Right now, the media is saying around 1,100, so I've, tempered, I've templated a brigade, which is much, much larger than that. Uh, but I wanted to, again, encapsulate all of the Americans that are potentially in this area, and not just uh, soldiers, but also support personnel as well. And I think that probably gives us uh, a decently uh, sized uh, representation of what's going on. As far as unit sizes for red forces and the uh, blue forces from Nigeria, don't know, don't have a clue. I've just templated a uh, brigade and we'll just kind of go from there as time moves on. So again, this is a real raw, real time-ish uh, look at what's going on. So give me uh, 10 more minutes or so and we'll be able to put a little bit more information on the map. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we've come back. It's been about uh, 10 to 15 more minutes and I've been able to uh, use social media again very hesitantly, but it's the only source I have. Uh, use social media to uh, figure out where a lot of these red forces are going to be uh, located and, and what's going on. So in doing so, I'm also starting to build a, a history, a kind of a back history of what's going on throughout the area. I'm able to pull up the offline copy of the CIA World Factbook and kind of understand a little bit more about the, the recent history of the area. And I'm able to start getting a an actual uh, map board put together. So I'm actually about halfway through updating my map board here, but this is uh, the tool right here that I'm going to be using myself to kind of battle track what's going on. Uh, and as we can see, I'm starting to get a feel for some of the players in here. I'm starting to get a feel for some of the the uh, situational emplacement, sit temp, right? The order of battle of, of Niger's military, what forces do they have to work with? Uh, even very conservatively, I was able to actually use my portable printer here to uh, pull from Kiwix, the offline Wikipedia, a very, very old, outdated uh, overview of Niger's military, which is basically just a, a handful of battalions of, I guess they're, they're calling them combined arms forces, but I think they're more along the lines of irregulars. But we'll get, again, we'll get into the commander's two minute update here in just a moment. Uh, what I wanted to show you here is, uh, again, a pitfall that you need to be aware of is that Looking at these two maps, you can see that the information is different, so which one's correct? Usually for what I, what I like to do is put in the corner, take a marker, and write in the corner of the map the last time it was updated. So anytime anything gets moved on the map, we write the time so that we're able to determine, again, which map is accurate. Like I mentioned, you don't want to split your maps up. You really never want to do that, but sometimes you have to, and I've done it more often than not. You shouldn't do that. You should have a common operating picture, right? But in the real world, sometimes you just got to work on your own little space over there, uh, whereas the commander is looking at something like this. In this case, I already know that this map's the most accurate, so I need to transpose what is on this map over to my actual uh, portable map board so that I can walk into my boss's office, lay it down on his desk, and give a two-minute briefing. Speaking of that two-minute briefing, let's actually go through some of the information and what I've been able to find out. Again, we're not really focusing so much on the briefing of what's going on in the country. That's not really what we're talking about. Uh, we, we really want to focus on how I'm able to do all of this stuff. So a two-minute briefing on a country where no one can even find it on a map, nobody knows what's going on there, you're not going to be able to enca encapsulate the entire situation in two minutes, uh, but we can do it as quickly as we possibly can. So really, most of this uh, crisis began on July 26, when Abdurrahmane Tachani, one of the military leaders of Niger, uh, seized power and deposed uh, the democratically elected, in heavy air quotes, uh, President Mohamed Bazoum. Bazoum remains, uh, fortunately, alive for now. Uh, he is alive in uh, his house in uh, the capital, Niamey, 
and he's under house arrest. Uh, he still has access to the internet, so we're able to still get statements from him, uh, allegedly from him. There hasn't been a real solid proof of life, but again, uh, that's kind of what we're working with. For now, Dachani is running the country. First of all, we'll start with Blue Forces because it's a little bit simpler. Uh, Nigeria has uh, partnered with ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. It's, it's a, mostly a trade coalition, but in this case, it's being used as a uh, military coalition. Uh, ECOWAS has imposed an ultimatum of reinstate Bazoom, stop the coup, or we're going to invade tomorrow night. So far, we have seen mobilization from a couple of countries, but mostly Nigeria, who has pushed a substantial amount of forces uh, to the north, again, in the Sokoto district. Right now, they've set up screening operations to kind of monitor the border on the other, on the other side. Now, again, in Africa, national international borders are basically just a dirt road, okay? There's really very few hard-packed, very few uh, MSRs, you know, main supply routes uh, that go across the country, but one of the biggest borders in the region is through Sokoto. So that's where Nigeria has forward deployed, as uh, I'm templating here because I don't know, an estimate of a uh, brigade's worth of troops. Again, when we're talking unit sizes, uh, you can't really think of these in terms of American unit sizes because, you know, an American brigade is fairly large, whereas a, a Nigerian brigade is probably half that size. So it's kind of the same story with the Russians. Like a Russian division is much smaller than an American division. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about numbers here. Other blue forces in the area that kind of complicate things are the Americans, again, at the bases, uh, the, Ni the Nigerian military base uh, just south of Agadiz Base 201. No real developments on that front. We'll have to get back to them later. I know it's an important feature, but we just don't have any information uh, regarding force protection other than the Americans at that base are confined to the base. We don't know if that's voluntarily confined to the base or if they're just kind of uh, taking precautions and sort of waiting things out to see what ECOWAS does uh, in the next few days. Either way, they're kind of hanging tight, sitting tight, and uh, we'll have to come back to them in a moment. So moving forward, uh, the most likely chance for a conflict to erupt is right here, uh, just across the border from the Sokoto district, uh, in along basically just any kind of pathway that leads into Niger from Nigeria. We have what I think is the 24th Combined Arms Infantry Battalion. Uh, it's hard to, again, gauge the unit sizes because most of Niger's military is technical-based, right? Uh, Up-armored land cruisers and your classic, uh, you know, dishka in the back of a pickup truck kind of setup. So uh, Niger does have some old-school T-62s, but we don't know where they are. They're probably, a lot of them are probably at the American base uh, or outside the, the base, uh, outside the capital of Niamey or at the Niamey airport. We'll have to get a better fidelity on armor, but again, T-62s are such an ancient system that there's really not that much of a threat they pose. Uh, far more likely to, to cause some serious damage are the shoot and scoot uh, technicals uh, with dishkas in the back. But again, that's where uh, the majority of conflict is going to break out, if it does break out. This is where a good flashpoint can occur because we have uh, Nigerian and Nigerian forces uh, really close proximity to each other. We also have very, very limited reporting, and this is purely an estimate on my part, that there's probably also another battalion-ish sized element to the east here uh, defending the crossing there. But again, that's just a template on my part. What we're a little bit more certain of is what's going on in the capital region. Again, unit sizes are hard to determine, but we know that the presidential district, uh, the government quarter of uh, Niamey, is under lockdown uh, from the, the majority of the Niger uh, military. We also know that they have some sort of SIGINT capability, so I've templated that uh, there on the map just to keep uh, keep aware of. Um, the, there is an airspace restriction over the entirety of Niger. The uh, It hasn't happened yet, but I would be willing to bet the FAA is probably going to issue a NOTAM closing uh, Niger's airspace, but they haven't done it yet because the ultimatum has not expired yet, so we're not really sure as to what's going on. Another uncertainty and yet another complication for this conflict is outside influence. So outside the country of Niger, we have a lot of political players. First of all, Burkina Faso is a similar uh, situation. The reason that uh, Burkina Faso is taking the side of Niger uh, along with Mali and sort of the nation of Guinea here off to, off to the left uh, is because all of these nations have had military coups 
uh, and they're currently being run by military juntas. So actually, statistically, the youngest president in the world right now is uh, a, ca a captain, actually, who has basically just taken control of Burkina Faso, uh, and he is the leader of that nation. So um, we're templating them as red forces because they have pledged military uh, allegiance uh, to Mali to help them defend against a potential ECOWAS invasion. But again, it's really hard to say what's going on because they're probably a very, very small military. I've templated uh, them as being a division in strength, but I don't know if that's an accurate representation. That might be the entirety of their military. So again, we'll need more fidelity on that as we go on. One of the more interesting complicating factors is what's going on uh, to the northwest of the country on the border between Mali and Niger, uh, which is Wagner. So. There's been limited reporting that has been confirmed by French intelligence, if that's you know trustworthy source for you, uh, that Wagner has been summoned and requested by the uh, military leadership of Niger to come in and provide protection. So dipping just a little bit into the backstory, right now the reasons for the coup are unclear, but it seems to be like uh, the reason, the main reason for the coup is the president of Niger uh, was fairly unpopular, taking advantage of the people, allegedly, uh, enriching himself instead of his nation, and uh, you know, the, the winds of change came and now we have a coup. Very similar stories to, you know, most of, of Africa, to be honest, but it, it seems to be like the classic uh, warlord taking control uh, situation. Now from that, uh, there are also anti-colonial elements to this, right? There are a lot of uh, anti-American sentiments, uh, very strong uh, anti-French sentiments uh, throughout the entire region, to be honest. Uh, but right now, uh, it seems like people in Niger are much more of a fan of Russia than of uh, America or France. So, for instance, there have been rallies in the capital city of Niamey um, with Russian flags being waved as people um, support that nation. So, again, Russian influence is, is very much a, a factor in this, in this coup situation, and because of that, the military leadership, the, the junta in Niger, has requested the presence of Wagner, uh, the infamous uh, PMC group uh, that has you know, gained notoriety worldwide. Interestingly enough, uh, we do have confirmation that there are there is a small team of advisors on the ground. Again, reliability hard to say, but it's almost certain. I would I would you know venture an analytical guess that there are uh, Wagner forces on the ground in the capital, probably of the day the coup happened, to be honest. But uh, there's reports that they're bringing in forces through Mali. And there's, again, follow-on information that suggests that Al-Qaeda militants uh, in the northwestern part of Niger have been combating uh, Wagner forces. Uh, one report says that, uh, it's very unconfirmed, one report says that Al-Qaeda had surrounded Wagner and uh, not let them enter the nation of Niger. I think that's bogus. I think that's not really true. We, we know uh, how Al-Qaeda reports tend to be, but again, this is an, yet another party, another force, uh, that the mil another military force in the region that is exhibiting power over the areas that they control. So again, that's going to be interesting to see as time goes on. So that's pretty much a good overview of what we're able to kind of improvise on the fly in just 20 or 30 minutes uh, with maybe 10 to 15 minutes tacked onto that for prep time. So certainly in less than an hour, you can do all of this. It doesn't require substantial, really good uh, Google foo or anything like that. You don't have to be a, a rock star analyst to put this together. You can spend maybe an hour or so and get something like this uh, improvised really, really easily. Like I mentioned, a lot of this is just purely guesswork. We're templating things, we're estimating, we're projecting. We can use whatever words we want to say, but we're basically just going off of our best guess for a lot of this stuff. And unfortunately, as slipshod as this seems, as, as kind of janky as this seems, this is what real battle tracking looks like when you have very little resources. I would honestly expect to walk into a military talk and see something, of course, better than this, but not much better. Uh, but if they have their own organic intelligence collection, you should see a lot more icons, a lot more uh, templating of the situation. But again, things that you can't template on the map, culture, history, uh, the geopolitical stuff, that stuff you've got to read about. Uh, using whatever resources you have. And if we have very little internet access, if we're just using Telegram or Twitter on like a, a local you know, phone that's using the local cell network and you just have garbage service, you're going to have to get most of your knowledge from offline resources. 
yeah, I thought it would be a good idea to kind of template this stuff and, and see how this goes. I'm going to follow this casually just to see how the situation uh, works out. But again, you know, we're kind of at a crossroads here where we're just kind of in a hurry up and wait uh, for that ultimatum to expire. Um, as far as what I think is going to happen, I don't know. Uh, I think that it's probably likely for some kind of military force to to um, uh, invade Niger. However, at the same time, you've got uh, a case of Nigeria uh, citizens and even as far away as Senegal, uh, Senegalese citizens voicing their outrage that their their military leadership wants to invade another nation. So, again, it's just a pure and utter mess, and I hope that even though this has been a disorganized way of showing things, this shows the chaos. This shows how little information you're going to have and how helpless you can be or how, how helpless you, you're going to feel uh, sometimes. This is just a commonality. Unfortunately, it's, it's far more common than you might think. Me personally, I want to get on the ground. I want to get my resources out there. I want to start working through the combat intel cycle. I want to start uh, you know, getting a team spun up to, uh, to, to go talk to other agencies and see uh, what kind of collection resources we have. We need to get eyes on target. We need to start downloading maps of the whole region. We need to start getting our uh, GeoInt guys on board with downloading uh, terrain data and uh, satellite imagery. And so we need to start plugging into higher level commands to get more, you know, better imagery. We need to talk to the SIGINT guys to see what kind of units they're templating in the area. Do you see how chaotic and just insane uh, this gets a lot of times? Uh, hopefully, hopefully we can calm down, we can take a very slow look at things, and just start with what we know. Because that's really what we're trying to do. We don't need to get absolutely spun out of control over stuff like this. We want to do the best job that we can using the resources we have. Most of the time it's not going to be good enough, and we have to be okay with that. Or, if, we're, if we can't be okay with that, then we have to at least try to do the best that we can. We can only do our best, and sometimes we're limited. In this case, we're limited by the flow of information. And since we're limited by the flow of information, now we can work back and we can start looking at history, culture, and see what we think is likely to happen uh, as we start learning more about this region. Earlier today, before I started this whole process, I had very little understanding of the, of the country, of the history of the place, of even where the country's at, right? I had very little understanding of that. Uh, but now, I have a much clearer picture, even after just a couple of hours of working through this kind of stuff and, you know, maybe an hour or so of research. So again, I'll keep plugging away at this and we'll see how far we're able to get and how, how uh, accurate we're able to get. Unfortunately, again, like, this, like I mentioned, this map's of the wrong scale, so we're going to have a lot of... Um, a lot of information that that's not the greatest, so I'm going to have to uh, basically print out some more of my own maps that I've uh, basically just very basic template maps uh, that I've created of the region and work off of those for more smaller, smaller level stuff. At the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. Being hard to kill and making it another day. Battle tracking is an essential part of that in today's world. Right now, battle tracking helps everyday citizens be more prepared by keeping one step ahead of the bad guys, whoever they may be. In the world of tomorrow, these skills are going to be mandatory just to break even. And one more thing to remember, do not forget that the little slips of paper you are pushing around a map, these are people. People with families that they want to come home to. This is not some expensive board game or Dungeons and Dragons, this is people's lives you are depicting. When an icon gets removed from the board, they don't get to play again. The military is one of the last institutions in society which forces respect to some degree. We salute each other and follow basic customs and courtesies. But today, when a lot of the younger crowd looks at their seniors, they don't really understand what those ribbons on their chest mean. Granted, after a few decades of senior military leadership just giving themselves awards, it's, it's not something that uh, is unexpected, but even though respect has truly been earned, it's sometimes not reflected by the actions of the younger soldiers, simply because they have no understanding what war is like. They look at a ribbon and they see their general who gave himself that ribbon, and they don't understand what somebody who actually really did earn that uh, went through. This affects battle tracking like you would not believe. It's easy to forget the human factor in training. 
even on the military side of things, it's just not possible to replicate in a training environment the shock of almost an entire unit being killed. We can cross-train and make sure that everyone knows how to do each other's job for tactical practicality, but we simply cannot train for the psychological impact of this. This is a huge point of friction between grunts and fobbits like us. Back in our talk, we're moving a piece of paper half an inch. In the real world, people are struggling to make that movement happen. From a command and control perspective, this is a touchy subject. The idea of how much an officer should know their troops has been debated since the early days of warfare. It's obviously not possible for an officer to know each and every one of their soldiers personally. And there is a lot of debate as to whether or not this is a good idea anyway, seeing as that officer is probably going to be sending these people to their death at some point. I personally take no position on this because I don't have that experience and I haven't had to make that difficult choice. But I can definitely warn against a few things. Like smoking and joking when consolidating icons on the map. After a while, things get monotonous in the talk, and your guys are likely to crack jokes, complain about the food, moan about the weather, or whatever. That's fine, it's a soldier's right to complain, and even so, a lot of times in the the more difficult jobs, uh, a sense of morbid humor kind of pops up. Uh, that's inevitable with a lot of very, very stressful jobs. But be aware of your surroundings and have some reverence when battle tracking. I know that I would be livid if I walked into the talk and found a bunch of snot-nosed kids who haven't seen combat treating my guys like they're slips of paper on a board game. I don't wish to create a divide between soldiers who have seen combat and those who haven't yet, but that divide was already created long before I was born. So I'll just say this, for the combat vets out there who are leading younger and experienced guys in this strange new world, either in the military or in serving your community, don't let them forget what you already learned the hard way. More often than not, the new guys may understand the textbook stuff, but the culture of the combat services will probably be a point of friction. Guide them in the right direction, and know that in today's world, you will probably have to be more of a parent than anything else to a lot of folks, even people who may be older than you. And for the guys who are new or inexperienced, trying to do the right thing in or out of the military, those who haven't had the unfortunate opportunity to test yourselves in battle yet, keep an open mind. And don't bring yourself down. Everyone was the new guy at some point, and everyone has to learn in their own way. Try to do this by keeping the wisdom learned the hard way in mind. That old guy that's about to retire or rotate home, sit down with him if he has time, just to talk, and more importantly, to listen. You may not like it, and you may think that you are on the right path already, and honestly, you might do this and find out that you know this person is not exactly a good resource. But more often than not, you will realize how valuable this simple task is once that person is gone. The same thing applies to the entire battle staff organization, to include battle tracking. Ask people why they do the things they do. People being afraid to ask questions has killed more people than we like to remember. So don't be embarrassed because you don't know something. Battle tracking is one of those things where you can play stump the chump all day long because somebody can know more symbols than you, somebody can know more about the environment than you, and you can generally be made to feel really bad because you feel like you just don't know anything. Don't let this happen. But rather, if you're in that situation, take it as a point to learn some more. Simply memorizing a bunch of shapes on a map is not going to be very useful when you've got artillery rounds landing around you. So always keep things in perspective and try to learn as best you can. Battle tracking may seem like it's a simple task, but it really is a skill that requires a lot of critical thinking, flexibility, and it's a task that is constantly changing. If you do it poorly and if you are not invested in bettering yourself, you are wasting your time. But if you practice and improve your skills, you'll find that this is a fundamental part of remaining as prepared as you can be, especially if you have to fight in the shade.